Hello everybody. I would like to talk to you today about... The other day I was helping clean out my elderly mother's home. I found something else in there that was really interesting. Um, it's called The Big Blow. It's a book. Big Blow. Yeah. Well, you know, words change over time. The Big Blow. <laughs> yeah, my mind is dirtier than yours, so I laughed a lot at it too. Um, it's about the Columbus Day Storm. In this book, I looked it up online. This is a very rare book. Um, there are used copies of it online. They sell for around $20 to $25. I'm not selling this one right now. It's in really good condition, too. I mean, the spine is just like, it's not even cracked. There's no cracking on the edge. Um, there's aging. I mean, the, the pages are beginning to yellow. Um, but it's in very good shape. The book is about the Columbus Day Storm, and I'll need to explain that a bit. Uh, it happened on, and it says here, in 1963, uh, October 12th, 1962, off by a year. On October 12th, 1962, what happened was there was a um, typhoon called Freya. Freya? Freya. Freya. Um, that developed in the Pacific, and it did the arc and it became oh what did they call it i i'm doing my video away from my computer right now so i don't know anything um extra tropical cyclone i think is what they call it um so once it left the tropics and arced over by canada uh it became what they call an extra tropical cyclone which means it's a typhoon but it's called something else it hit the west coast round about, as it shows it, round about down in California. And it kind of went up through Oregon and Washington. The peak velocities of the wind at Hebo was 170 miles an hour. That's on the coast. Corvallis, 125 miles an hour. Portland, 160 miles an hour. It caused incredible amounts of damage. I remember my stepfather talking about this. Uh, he was living in Oregon at the time. Uh, we weren't, I, my family wasn't there yet. I wasn't even born yet. It was, it was 1962. It was pretty bad. I, but So this book, to give more background on the book, the book was written by a local a professional writer photographer, a local journalist named Ellis... Lucia, or Lucia, I, I don't know how to pronounce that name, I'm sorry, guy, um, L-U-C-I-A, uh, probably Lucia, uh, Lucia, I'm, I'm so, I, I apologize for not being able to say that name right, uh, he wrote this book, it was published locally, and that's probably another why you can't find this book anymore, it was published locally by the News Times Publishing Company of Forest Grove, Oregon, I don't even know if it's there anymore. Uh, it was published in 1963, and for additional copies of this book, write Storm Book, 1835 North Highland Street, Portland, 17, Oregon. Probably not there anymore. And, and you know, look at that. No, not even a um, zip code. Another interesting thing about this book is it costs a dollar. But remember, in those days, a, um, I mean, they're just off the top of my head, a, a burger would probably be about 25 cents. So if you think of it in modern money, this book, if it was a modern book, costs around about 20 bucks, which is about what a, you know, a, a specialty book about a specialty event in a tourist, you know, it would probably be in a, in a touristy kiosk or a touristy store. That's probably about how much it would be, probably about 15 or 20 bucks. So it kind of works out. It was $1. That would have been a lot of money back then. So this, uh... This writer, he put together this book. He lived locally. Uh, I guess he worked for, it says here, he's written about the Pacific Northwest and the West for national regional publications, worked for a lot of people. Um, he studied hundreds of reports and articles, photographs, talked with people. This is a very good book. Uh, it's too bad it um, it's so rare because I, it's sort of kind of a very rare event. I mean, how many people go around wanting to know about the Columbus Day Storm of the Pacific Northwest? Even now in the Pacific Northwest, it's it's not really forgotten. It's just one of the more rare trivia events, especially with the influx of 
new people from California and stuff that don't really know Oregon history. Uh, they well, and it's another thing too is that the Pacific Northwest does get hit by these periodic storms every now and again. We had a bad one in '91. Uh, that was that nor'easter. And apparently there was another really bad one in the 1890s that, like, wiped out Shampooey, or no, Shampooey drowned. Uh, so we get a bad windstorm through these areas, like a typhoon or a gale, really bad one, every maybe 20 years. So, and another thing about this book, it's very well written. Um, this was in the days when they proofread everything in... It's, it's really well, it isn't like some cheap thing that's been self-published. And they did a really good job with it. And even after all this, this is book was, it is for 1963. It's five years older than I am. And it's in really good condition. The pages are all solid and they're not torn. But anyway, the... the the book is about that storm. Now, and it really did bad damage. For instance, um, let's see. Here's a picture of this car. Let me get this in here. This car has had a tree fall on it. Don't think anyone was inside, but um, people did die. There was a big death toll in this storm. It says in the back. Um, total death in three states, 48, blamed on the storm. Oregon fatalities were 24. Damage total, 170 million. In 1963, 170 million dollars worth of damages. I, I was reading on other sources that there were areas that were out of power for months after this. Weeks, months. They, they basically had to rewire the entire grid in some areas, I read. Uh, which is probably good in some ways because they redid it and it was probably better. But what a way to get it done. Number of families without power, 496,000. Uh, number of telephones out, 129,900. Planes wrecked. He really goes through this list. There's this nice list in the back of this book. He basically just summarizes everything that happened. There was 226 aircraft wrecked. 24 hangars wrecked. Public school damages, 2.2 million. And I... Which had my, I don't even have my phone with, well, my phone's right there. That's a lot of money in 1963. I mean, just look up one of those converters you can find, you know, converting past money to modern money. I mean, $2.2 .2 million in 1963. I, just on the off chance, I, I, I just say add a zero at least. Probably more than that. Um, most of the damages were in Oregon because as you saw it hit the beach down nearby Eureka down by Crescent City went up through the valley and that was another bad thing too is because we have this coast range here that protects us against most stuff but this guy went around it like the Maginot line and went right up the valley because there's this big valley in there and there's a Willamette the Willamette River goes through there and there's this huge valley and it just it probably helped it it went through like a cone and blew right up here. And then the gorge here is another system of uh, where you can get things focused in a little bitty space. And that probably didn't help either because it just probably blew through there like a, well, typhoon. And then it looks like it went back off Aberdeen and pittered out up there. So, yeah, it caused incredible damage. And um, here... Here's a statue that got blown over. This big iron horse. The caption says, A falling spruce knocked over the three and a half ton circuit rider statue. It doesn't say where it was. But it says in the text. Uh, don't know. Don't know if it ever got replaced either. Um, Here is a, a savage gale sends a pole careening into a power truck. So these poor guys were probably out in the early parts of the storm trying to do something, and their truck got smashed. I hope they didn't get smashed. Mm. Here's some of those planes they talked about. Aircraft at airports were just blown around. I don't think there's any pictures of 
and water mains. Water mains were ripped by falling trees. This is at Salem, it says. So there was water mains bursting. So this was major damage in 1963, in basically in Oregon. There's a street of fallen trees, and luckily, I think they missed that house, but it was a mess. I remember my, my stepfather talking about, they had these huge pine trees around the farm he lived in at the time, and they all came down. Um, they were far enough away not to hit any barns or anything, but they probably spent a couple of weeks cleaning up that mess. Here it says, warehouses were splintered, county fairgrounds ruined. It doesn't say what county, uh, but... They probably had to build a new fairground after that. The storm sailed on relentlessly, pounding town and country around Dayton, McMinnville, Newburgh, Forest Grove, and Hillsboro. These names to me are like, that's where I grew up. So <laughs> reading off those names is like reading off names in your backyard. Uh, terror in the big town. This guy, he he writes, you can tell he's a journalist because he writes so, ooh, you know, like a hard-hitting uh, terror in the big town. Just before the big blow reached Portland, a strange, eerie glow appeared in the stormy eastern sky. Many saw its haunting orange rays and wondered about it. The light itself was a phenomena, although a Nebraskan commented he's seen similar spectacles accompany storms in the Midwest. Maybe dust? All the dust getting blown in the atmosphere? Um, oh, here's a... Swan Island is a... I think they still use it. It's a it's in Portland, and they use it to dock larger ships. And here is this ship that's got blown off the dock and into the other side of the passage. Look at this car; it's completely pulverized. And it, what does it say? Um, late model car <laughs> sucks for them. It was new then. I'll be head insurance. Late model car was buried by bricks from nearby Portland building. So these bricks got blown off of a building in Portland. And totally pummeled this late model car. Probably somebody's new car. <laughs> that was my car. Uh, the storm. Now remember the storm hit. It probably lasted just a couple hours. Just a few hours. So it, was just, it wasn't like goes on for days and days and days. Uh, and the corridor. He says it affected a 120 mile wide corridor for a thousand miles. It also says down here, the Columbus Day Storm was declared the nation's worst natural disaster of 1962 by the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. Yeah, there was a lot that had to be paid out. Oof, here's a tree that did come down in a house. It split that thing in two. It says, at Kelso, great fur knifed Dolph Price home. She was on one side, he was on the other, neither were injured. Well, they were lucky. Um, oh, he likes this one because in the caption it says, uh, Portland Park Blocks look like battlefield next morning. Bottom, keep parks clean, says sign on the refuse container. So he liked that irony of the, where's the container? It's, I can't even see. It's right down here in the corner. And there's a little sign that says, keep parks clean. Well, it's good. probably took a long time to clean up that mess. So, yeah, this is a very good book. And, you know, it's not even listed as a source in Wikipedia for the Columbus Day Storm. So, you know, they didn't even have that. I don't know. Other than personal antidotes, I mean, they probably, you know, the, the data, they've got the basic data. But, of course, this guy did... Um, that... You know, like up here, big blow. I mean, I think that's called have a gay old time trope. It's where language has changed since then. Because down here it says, the Longview Daily News had headlined the day's edition. And I don't, it says, fagged out Freya to pay rainy call today. Fagged out. But she wasn't fagged out, was she? Because that's what we're going to, that's. The lady did today's edition said, we're going to get a big storm today because this tired out storm. <laughs> yeah, I know. The language changes over time. This was over 50 years ago. It was 54? 54 years ago? 
State reports bad storm due here in two hours. Both were understatements, and from then on, police were too busy to write reports. So they totally were caught. That's another thing, too, is they were caught under wares. They knew the storm was coming. They, they I mean, it was being tracked. They, they had stuff back then. They, they had um, instruments to tell them it was coming. For instance, here's something. It's a barometer. And it says, hours before the big blow, barometers were nosediving. This one at Pacific University plunged to 28.755 before power went off at 5.30. So they knew it was coming. They just underestimated how bad it was going to be. They just thought, oh, it's just a tagged out storm. It's just a storm that's, you know, it was a typhoon, but it's, it's all good. And, you know, it caught them by surprise. I suppose what it probably may have done is somehow re-energized itself. I mean, I know that can sometimes happen to storms where they kind of pitter out, but then something makes them grow strong again. Might have done that right before it hit the continent. And here's another picture of an air of a airport getting blown to bits. There's a little airplane over here getting smashed. And let's see. There's it's just it's, it's full of pictures. They that's another thing too. It's probably why it was so expensive. I don't even know if a well a touristy kind of make money off an event thing would probably have a lot of pictures in it even nowadays. And it would be twenty bucks. Of course, the pictures would be in color. You may have noticed these are all in black and white. They had. I'm sure they had color photography at that time, but it was uh, very expensive. And not so much for the guy. I mean, this, this Ellis guy, he probably had a color camera. It was, they'd even taken these in color and then they grayscaled them. They used to do that too. Well, they would do something special when they redeveloped it. They didn't have like PaintShop Pro. Um, they may have done that to save on printing these books because even if the pictures were in color and I uh, that it would have been cheaper to print their book in black and white. Here, look at this. Flying debris punctured and smashed trailer houses. This beam has been speared into this trailer house by the storm. It just chucked it in there. Power lines are smashed. Oh, I like this one. It was, uh, these guys are working. It says, full-scale logging was needed to get power and telephones back. Uh, I like it because there's this truck on the side over here. If you look real close, it says PGE on this ancient, cute old truck. Uh, PGE is still around, Portland General Electric. And, I, you know, you still see their trucks, only they don't look like this. I think it'd be cool. They should keep these trucks. <laughs> you know, it's one of those old 1950s trucks. Probably was blue, because that's the color they use. Now, at least. Oh, look, college students at Pacific University and other schools, Pacific University's in Forest Grove, if memory serves, and other schools cleaned up campus debris then helped out in the towns. Oh, so look, this is when college students were helpful. Well, between, like, skipping classes and... It was the 60s. I mean, it was 1963. The Beatles had just started. Man, they, oh, those guys were lucky. Can you imagine hearing the Beatles for like nobody had ever heard them before? Uh, modern living was at a standstill without power for heat, cooking. I think he meant to say something else. Uh, I think he was cutting himself short. But anyway, they're just showing that basically the power grid was gone. The power grid was just, just gone. Here's a Bonneville Tower. A Bonneville Tower toppled in the Sandy Am era, taking area, taking the wires with it. So, yeah. men and equipment were rushed long distances to disaster area. The fleet of 103 telephone trucks came from California by special train. Tale of a Typhoon? Trees downed a Salem telephone cable exchange, or exchange cable, isolating communities. So it took down trunk cables that just completely cut off branches of the, branches of the um, infrastructure. Half this barn roof 
flew through the air, section landed near a fence. So this barn here, this whole area here just blew off and it says landed near the fence. I don't, was it over here? Um, no, that's another faraway house. Great route. Yeah, this is an interesting book though. A lot of text too. He goes on and talks about, it'll take 10 years for me to get back where I was, said one farmer. Others would never come back. Few of the Willamette Valley's 40,000 farms escaped damage. No, they didn't. This, I wonder if this is that same barn. It's just been blown open. I mean, it just looks like a war zone, like he said. And, ooh, cattle were crushed by falling bales and beams. This is at Savi Island. It, there's no cattle in the picture, I think. He just says that's what happened to him. They probably... You know, back then they wouldn't take such a, you know, you know, it'd be too, too horrible to put in the book. But he's saying that there were cattle that would get crushed in there. Farm damage ran high. Blown down in the forests. Portland's famed rhododendron gardens were among ruined parks. So I guess in those days, the Rose Fet, the Rose Park, or the rhododendron park they have up there, um, the earlier versions of it, are somewhere in that mess. Because that's just a whole bunch of fallen trees and brush. The, the historic old apple tree at Vancouver lost its top but held its ground. I wonder if it's still there. I'll have to look it up. I guess this was a historic tree, and the top of it got blown off, but the rest of it stayed there. So, um, that's basically it. Echoes of Columbus Day. It was a really bad windstorm, and it blew away a lot of stuff. And some people still remember it. I don't, uh, the phrase October storm, Columbus storm, and the day of the big wind will be around for a long, long while. Well, yes, it will. Anyway, and so I thought it was really neat. Oh, finding this book. And it was nice sharing it with you. I hope you enjoyed it. I will talk to you later. Thank you very much for watching.